1. Hope County Sheriff's Deputy Ian Kramer gripped the steering wheel tightly as he maneuvered the treacherous highway through the swirling snow. The citizens of Crystal Lake, Wisconsin were likely thrilled to have a white Christmas, but he was the one stuck working night shift over the holiday and patrolling the county in the middle of a blizzard was not his idea of fun. Not that he was complaining. After everything that had happened with his brother a few months ago, he was lucky to have his job at all. He was very grateful that after a lengthy month-long investigation, Sheriff Luke Toretti had allowed him to return to duty. The graveyard shift wasn't his favorite, but he was willing to take whatever his boss gave him. No way was he going to ruin the second chance he'd been given. The wind kicked up, blowing snow horizontally across the country highway, buffeting his SUV. He was moving at a crawl and thankfully didn't see any traffic on the road. He hoped the townsfolk were smart enough to stay home rather than risking their lives driving through this. No such luck. He carefully navigated a hairpin turn in the road and caught a glimpse of dim flashers blinking on and off. As he approached, he could see that a car was nose down, stuck in the ditch. The vehicle was covered in snow, so much that in another hour, even the flashers would be difficult to see. If the battery held out for that long. Ian slowed to a stop and peered through the windshield, trying to read the license plate so he could run the tag through the system. Unfortunately, the information was obliterated with snow. He contacted the dispatcher to let her know that he was responding to a stranded vehicle off Highway ZZ. Warily, he slid out from the driver's seat, ducking his head and tugging his hat further on his head against the ferocious wind. He approached the driver's side door, but the foggy window made it impossible to see who was inside. He sharply rapped on the window. I'm Deputy Kramer, he shouted. Is everyone all right in there? There was a long pause, and he doubted his voice carried above the howling wind. He tapped on the window again, and to his surprise, it lowered, revealing the pale face of a woman. Kramer? Ian Kramer, she echoed in surprise. He bent over to get a better look, and his eyebrows shot up in surprise when he recognized the woman's heart-shaped face framed with long dark hair. Sarah Miller, he said in a shocked tone. Her slight smile faded. My last name is Franklin now. And that's my five-year-old son Ben in the back seat. Sarah was married. And had a son. The news shouldn't have surprised him. After all, they'd only spent one summer together and that had been ten years ago. But the three months they'd shared together were forever etched in his memory. He'd fallen for Sarah hard and ridiculously thought she felt the same way. Yet when summer had ended Sarah hadn't returned his phone calls. After a few weeks, he'd given up since he was attending college in Madison. He'd never heard from her again. Disturbing to realize that he'd never forgotten her. Hi Ben, he said to the youngster curled up in a sleeping bag in the back seat. Where on earth was Sarah's husband? She shouldn't have been driving in this storm all by herself. I tried to call for a tow truck but couldn't get through. Sarah shrugged. I left a message with Billy's auto repair. Hank owns the garage but unfortunately he's out of town, Ian said. He's visiting his daughter in Madison and won't be back until after Christmas. The spark of hope in her eyes dimmed. I don't suppose you can somehow pull me out of the ditch, she hesitantly asked. He could, but there was no telling what damage had been done to her car and he doubted that it was drivable. Besides, he'd rather get Sarah and her son somewhere safely out of the storm. I'll give you a ride, and we'll work on getting your car unstuck later. Do you have a reservation at the hotel? No. I'm heading to my grandparents' cabin. I appreciate you giving us a ride. Would you mind getting our suitcases out of the trunk? Suitcases? Ian thought it was odd that she'd come up to her grandparents' place two days before Christmas, but then again, for all he knew, her husband might be meeting her there so they could spend a rustic holiday together. The idea left a sour taste in his mouth. No, I don't mind. He tried not to remember the last time he'd been to her grandparents' cabin, the night he kissed her beneath the stars. Ancient history, he reminded himself as Sarah popped the trunk. There were three suitcases and several boxes crammed in the trunk without any room to spare. 
He couldn't help wondering just how long Sarah and her son were planning to stay. There was way more stuff here than what they'd need if they were just visiting over the holiday break from school. Not that Sarah's plans were any of his business. He fought against the wind and swirling snow, grabbing the suitcases and hauling them over to store them in the back of his SUV. Sarah joined him, looking cute in her pink parka with matching hat and gloves. Ian, would you be willing to take the boxes too if there's enough room? Sure. He saw her son standing beside her, the hood of his coat up over his head and a scarf covering a good portion of his face. Why don't you and Ben get inside where it's warm? I'll take care of moving everything over. She nodded, looking relieved. Thank you. He trudged through the snow, until he had everything from Sarah's car, including the sleeping bag and booster seat from the back seat. Sarah wrestled with securing the booster seat, while Ian kicked the snow from his boots and slid behind the wheel. Ready? he asked as he started the engine and blasted the heat on high. Yes, Sarah's voice was strong as she glanced back at Ben as if to reassure her son. We're ready, right Ben? The boy paused, then nodded. Right, Mom? Ian nodded and slowly pulled back out onto the highway. He noticed that Ben hadn't said much, and his instincts warned him that something wasn't quite right with this situation. He was surprised at how much he wanted to help and protect Sarah from whatever was causing the shadows in her eyes. But unless she was involved in something illegal, which he highly doubted, he needed to remember her problems weren't his concern. He had his brother to worry about, and that was a huge challenge. Jesse was finally getting the psychiatric help he needed, but Ian was still worried about his brother's emotional stability. The last thing Ian needed was to put his job at risk, especially not for a married woman. He'd get Sarah and her son safely to her grandparents' cabin. From there, she could call her husband for help if needed. Sarah momentarily closed her eyes and silently prayed, seeking strength. She'd never in her wildest dreams imagined that Ian Kramer was still living in Crystal Lake. Or that he was a deputy with the sheriff's department. She'd been 17 to Ian's 18 during that summer they'd spent together. They'd been inseparable, swimming and boating in the lake, taking long walks on the hiking trail, and sitting by the campfire roasting marshmallows at night. Ian had kissed her several times, nothing too heavy, until the night before she had to leave to return home. They'd kissed beneath the stars, passion simmering between them. She was ashamed to admit that Ian had been the one to break things off before their young love spiraled out of control. Sarah? Are you all right? Ian asked, breaking the silence. She opened her eyes and took a deep breath, forcing a smile. I'm fine, thanks so much for coming to our rescue. I'm surprised you decided to drive up here, despite the storm warnings that have been on the news for the past 24 hours, Ian admitted. She hoped the darkness hid the desperation she knew was reflected in her eyes. The minute she heard David, her ex-husband, was going to be released from jail, she'd loaded up her car and driven north. She hadn't heard the weather reports until she was on the highway, but even then she wouldn't have let the snow stop her. I was already on the road when I heard the news, she said, trying to keep her voice steady. I didn't realize your grandparents had kept the cabin, Ian said, shooting her a sidelong glance. I thought maybe your family had sold it. Sarah knew what he was really asking, since she hadn't returned his many phone calls ten years ago. And at the very least, she owed him an explanation. A week after returning home after our summer together, my mother was diagnosed with stage 4 uterine cancer. My father, she hesitated, unwilling to speak ill of the dead. He didn't handle it well. Instead of being supportive, he worked longer and longer hours, using every excuse possible to avoid coming home. Six months after my mother passed away, he died of a massive heart attack. Oh Sarah, I'm sorry for your loss, Ian said, reaching out to take her hand. The simple comforting gesture made tears spring to her eyes, and she struggled to blink them back before Ian noticed. I can't imagine what you went through. Losing both your parents so close together must have been terrible. You should have called me, I would have been there for you. Looking back, it was easy to see how different her life might have been if she'd garnered the courage to make that call. But then again, she wouldn't have been and she could never regret having her son. Ben meant everything to her. 
I was pretty focused on staying in high school so I could graduate and being there for my mother, she said softly. And then so much time had passed it didn't seem right to call you. I would have come no matter when you called, he said, giving her hand a gentle squeeze before releasing her. She missed his warmth and twisted her fingers together to prevent herself from reaching for him. Sarah knew she couldn't afford to let her foolish teenage emotions get the better of her. Ian had been the center of her world that summer, but the reality of her mother's cancer and her father's avoidance had caused her to push the memories aside. She'd convinced herself that he'd moved on without her. And she'd moved on as well. Realizing too late that she'd made the wrong choice in marrying David. But there was nothing to be gained by rehashing the past. Well anyway, that's enough about my life. What about you? She asked, eager to change the subject. I'm so impressed that you're a sheriff's deputy. He lifted a brow and sent her a sideways glance. I'm pretty sure I told you that I wanted to be a cop when I grew up, he reminded her. And she'd wanted to be a nurse. Regret burned in the back of her throat. She'd only managed to complete a nursing assistant program before her mother passed away. Yes you did, she said softly. I didn't start my nursing degree. I completed my nurse's aid training, but that's all. Which reminded her she'd need to get a job within the next few weeks before she depleted her meager savings. But that would have to wait until after the holidays. We have a hospital here, he said, as if reading her mind. Eighteen months ago, I spent more time there than I wanted to. What happened? He lifted a shoulder. Gunshot wound, but I survived. The staff there took good care of me. Sarah swallowed hard, more upset than she had a right to be about his close call. Why was she dredging up her old feelings for Ian? After ten years they were two completely different people, nothing at all like the carefree teenagers they'd been. Are you married? she asked, striving for a casual tone. Nope. Got close once but things didn't work out. Her own five-year marriage proved that was the understatement of the year. Her divorce had been finalized over two years ago, but that hadn't stopped David from coming after her. And now that he'd been released from jail, her brief respite was over. Lucky that you found out ahead of time, she said before she could stop herself. Less complicated that way. Ian frowned. Sarah, what's wrong? Why isn't your husband with you? She glanced over her shoulder, relieved to see that Ben had fallen asleep. We're divorced, she said simply. I haven't changed my name because of Ben. It's less complicated to share the same last name. I guess I can understand that, Ian said with a nod. How long have you been divorced? Two years. She had no idea why she was telling him this. It wasn't as if she was interested in picking up where their summer romance left off. The last thing she wanted was to jump into another relationship. Once was more than enough. Oh, is that the driveway to my grandparents' place? She asked, changing the subject as the highway marker caught her attention. That's it, although it might be tricky getting into the driveway, he cautioned. Having four-wheel drive isn't fail-safe. She refused to let the news upset her. She was more than willing to walk up to the cabin, if necessary. Ian gunned the engine, and barreled through the snowdrifts without stopping until he reached the clearing in front of the cabin. The welcome sight of the familiar rustic dwelling gave her an overwhelming sense of relief. Ben, we're here, she said, reaching back to shake her son awake. He opened his eyes, but then groggily closed them again. Let him sleep, Ian suggested. I'll carry him in for you. I can do it, she said quickly. But would you be willing to light a fire for us? Of course. Do you have the key? She smiled. Don't you remember? It's in the flower pot on the porch. Ian looked surprised but nodded. I do remember. Stay here, let me check things out first. All right. She sat back in her seat, knowing she shouldn't be leaning on Ian like this. Hadn't she learned the hard way that it was better to stand on her own two feet? She'd vowed never to be dependent on a man again. With renewed determination, she pushed her door open and tried not to gasp as she was hit by a blistering wave of cold air. Winters in Crystal Lake were far different than summers, that's for sure. 
although they had tough winters in Chicago too. She refused to be wimpy. After trudging around to the back of the police vehicle, she fumbled with the latch. After two tries she finally found the release. She grabbed the smaller of the suitcases and then closed the tailgate so the snow wouldn't get inside before heading up toward the cabin. The door was open, which was a relief since that meant Ian had found the key. The interior of the cabin smelled musty and was only slightly warmer than being out in the wind and snow. The only light was from Ian's flashlight which was propped beside him. I told you I'd carry everything in, Ian chided gently from his kneeling position in front of the wooden stove. I know but I'm not helpless, and I appreciate that you're getting the fire started. She glanced around the cabin, surprised to note that it didn't look all that much different from the last time she'd been here. Of course her grandparents had come up here on occasion over the years, at least until they'd retired in Arizona, but she hadn't been back. Until now. She walked into the small kitchenette and opened the drawers until she found a few candles and matches. She placed the candles around the room, the dancing flames helping to chase away the darkness. When she walked over to the wood-burning stove, she was pleased to see that Ian had gotten a small fire started from the wood that was stacked on the floor beside it. Maybe it was only her imagination, but it seemed like the interior of the cabin was already warming up from the fire. Ian glanced up at her. It will take me a while to get this going. Why don't you bring Ben inside? I'll get the rest of your stuff as soon as I'm finished. She nodded. After all, Ben was her top priority. Before going back outside she went into the smaller of the two bedrooms, grateful to see that the mattresses were still intact and hadn't been attacked by rodents. They'd be fine using the sleeping bags for tonight, since she knew she'd have to sleep in the living room to keep the fire going anyway. Feeling certain they were safe here, she eagerly headed back outside to get her son. After freeing him from the booster seat, she picked him up in her arms. Ben was large for his age, and she staggered a bit as she headed inside the cabin. Ian met her at the doorway, and gently pried her son away, easily handling his weight. Hang on, I need to gab the sleeping bag. When she returned a few minutes later, her heart melted when she saw that Ian was holding Ben on his lap in front of the fire. We're at the cabin. Ben asked, rubbing his eyes. Yes, we're here. You're going to use your sleeping bag tonight. Won't that be fun? Her son nodded and yawned. Ian stood and carried Ben into the bedroom, waiting for her to arrange the sleeping bag before lowering her son to the mattress. She sat beside him, making sure he was tucked in. Mom? Dad's not going to find us, is he? Ben asked. Her heart clenched in her chest and tears pricked at her eyes as she leaned down to press a reassuring kiss on his forehead. No, he's not going to find us. Go to sleep, okay? Okay. Good night. Her son closed his eyes and curled up onto his side. When she straightened, she found Ian's intense gaze boring into hers and knew with a sinking feeling that he wasn't going to leave until he knew the truth. 2. Ian tried not to let his anger show on his face, even though he knew he should have trusted his instincts right from the start. Of course there was nothing innocent about why Sarah had decided to drive through a blizzard to come back to Crystal Lake after 10 years. She and her son were hiding from her ex. He followed Sarah back to the living room, putting a few more logs into the wood-burning stove before closing and latching it shut. When he was calm, he turned to face her. Okay, Sarah. What's going on? Sarah's cheeks were flushed, but she tilted her chin stubbornly. Nothing is going on, Ian. I came here because I needed a break. The cabin belongs to my grandparents, and they don't mind me being here. I didn't lie about being divorced, and in case you were wondering, I was granted sole custody of Ben. The thought had crossed his mind that she'd run off with her son, not that he would have blamed her. The thought of Ben being afraid of his own father made him seethe with fury. He kept his tone as non-threatening as possible. I'm glad to hear that, but I am a police officer. You can trust me. For a moment she looked as if she might tell him, but then shook her head. There's nothing to tell. Who was she trying to fool? She'd never been good at lying, 
a fact that had gotten them in trouble more than once that summer when they'd occasionally stayed out past her curfew. Fine, I'll figure out what happened on my own. What's your ex-husband's name? She hesitated before she responded. David. But I'm sure he's more interested in getting his life back than worrying about us. The way Sarah avoided his gaze made him believe she was glossing over the details, big time. He knew very well there was more to this story, and it was frustrating that she wouldn't tell him the truth. But before he could ask anything more, his radio went off. Unit 12, we have a report regarding a two-vehicle crash on the interstate on ramp from Highway Double Z. What's your 20? Ian grimaced, knowing he was the closest deputy. He pushed the button on the side of his radio to respond. I'm about five miles away. I'll get there as soon as possible. 10-4 He didn't want to leave Sarah and Ben in the cabin alone, but he wasn't going to shirk his duty either. Especially not when he was still on probation after the fiasco with Jesse. I have to take this call, but write down my phone number. I want you to call me if you need anything. I'm sure we'll be fine, she protested, crossing her arms across her chest. He suppressed a sigh and dug into his breast pocket for his small notebook. He ripped a page out and quickly scribbled his phone number across the paper before thrusting it into her hand. Take it, and I'll stop by after my shift is over to check on you. There's no need, I don't want to be a bother. You're not a bother, he said, even though that wasn't entirely true. He was very bothered by the thought that she was on the run from her ex-husband. And he was bothered by her refusal to let him help. But since he didn't have time to stand there and argue with her, he turned and left the cabin, making sure the door was locked behind him. There were two keys on the ring and the planter, so he kept one in his pocket so he could return early the next morning to chop more firewood. The wind hadn't let up, forcing him to spend a good five minutes brushing the snow off his car before he turned around and headed back toward the road. Several times his tires spun crazily, and he was relieved when he made it back to the highway without getting stuck. As he headed toward the interstate, it appeared that a snowplow had been through recently, since there was a strip down the middle of the road that wasn't snow-covered. He glanced at the time, realizing that it was later than he'd thought, a little past one in the morning. Six more hours to go until the end of his shift. At least fighting through the storm would help the time go by faster. Because no matter what Sarah had said, he was determined to go back to check on them. Maybe she was safe at her grandparents' cabin for now, since he doubted that her ex-husband would be able to find the place in the storm. But the snowy weather wouldn't last forever. And Ian feared it wouldn't take much for David Franklin to find Sarah and Ben. Despite the late hour, Sarah wasn't the least bit sleepy. She only had a six-pack of water and needed to save that for drinkings, so she searched for several large pots and pans in the kitchen, and took them outside to fill them with snow. Then she set them on the table to melt so they'd have wash water in the morning. She blew out the candles, knowing she'd need to save them for the next few days until she could figure out if there was a way to get electrical service hooked up. The musty smell inside the cabin made her sneeze, and she wished that she could open the windows to air the place out. Since that wasn't an option she snuggled down in her sleeping bag, grateful that she'd washed it a few weeks ago. The day she'd learned about David's parole hearing, in fact. After all, her mother's illness had taught her to always be prepared for the worst. She closed her eyes, trying to forget the memories that came rushing back. Memories of the carefree summer she'd spent with Ian. The sobering shock at finding out about her mother's cancer. Her father's subsequent heart attack. David's slow and insidious betrayal. After taking several deep breaths she prayed, seeking peace. She'd sought refuge in church after David's arrest, pleased to discover that faith could fill the holes in her heart and soul in a way she'd never expected. She only wished she'd found the strength of faith sooner. Before she'd met David. Before her parents had died within six months of each other. Sarah gave herself a mental shake. Enough with the regrets, already. She and Ben were fine. David wasn't supposed to be anywhere near her, and he didn't know the location of the cabin. And if by some strange chance he did show up, she'd have him arrested. Just the thought of David finding them made her shiver with fear, 
despite the cozy warmth radiating from the wood-burning stove. She silently recited the prayers she knew by memory, finally relaxing enough to fall asleep. A loud bang woke her up and she shot upright on the sofa, looking around in panic. Her gaze stumbled across Ian kneeling next to a pile of fallen logs. Sorry, Ian said as he stacked the logs back up and then slowly rose to his feet. She realized he must have dropped the wood, which explained the loud noise. She jammed a hand through her tangled hair. I'm perfectly capable of bringing in the firewood, she muttered. Ian lifted a brow, looking far more handsome in the early morning light than she remembered. Or maybe she hadn't looked at him closely enough last night. It took her a minute to realize he'd changed out of his uniform, wearing soft denim jeans and a flannel work shirt beneath his jacket. Yes, I'm sure you are, but since I'm here, why not let me take care of it? You probably didn't get much rest. And by the way, the storm is over. The snow stopped about an hour ago. She was exhausted, but refused to let Ian Kramer bulldoze her. When he left the cabin again, she crawled out of the sleeping bag and pulled a heavy navy blue Chicago sweatshirt over her t-shirt. She slipped her feet into her running shoes and then walked over to the table. The pots she'd filled with snow were now more than half full of water, so she carried the largest one over to set it on top of the wood-burning stove to get warm. Then she used water bottles to fill the tea kettle. Digging through one of the boxes she'd packed before leaving home, she found several packets of instant oatmeal and two apples. Maybe not exactly a gourmet breakfast, but enough that they wouldn't go hungry. Ian returned with another armload of wood. He took the time to stack the logs into neat piles. Was anyone hurt? she asked, breaking the silence. He glanced up in surprise and then shook his head when he realized what she was asking. No, thankfully the drivers of the cars were both driving slow enough that there were no injuries. I'm glad, she murmured, going through the kitchen drawers to find spoons. We're having oatmeal for breakfast if you're hungry. Her pulse jumped when his teeth flashed in a wide smile. Sounds great. She stared at him for a long minute, struck by just how different Ian was from David. How could she have believed herself to be in love with a man who used his tongue like a whip? Constantly cutting her down was one thing, but she couldn't bear it when David began to treat Ben the same way. And then things had gone from bad to worse. Mom? I have to go to the bathroom. She turned to find Ben standing there, rubbing his eyes and looking adorably sleep-rumpled. Her heart swelled with love and relief when she realized her son seemed more like his normal self after a good night's sleep. Me too, she confided. But we're going to have to use the outhouse, remember? The snow is deep so put on your coat and your boots, okay? Not too deep. I shoveled a path when I first got here, Ian said. She was grateful she didn't have to do the work, but at the same time, she didn't like feeling helpless. Thanks but I could have done that too. I grew up in Chicago, I know how to deal with snow. And I know what it's like to rough it up here. Not in the winter, he pointed out. She narrowed her gaze, tempted to tell him to get lost and leave her alone, but Ben was hopping from one foot to the other, so she quickly helped her son get his coat and boots on, before grabbing her own winter things. Wow look at all this snow! Ben exclaimed when they walked out onto the porch. A good twelve inches had fallen fresh snow covering the bare tree branches in a way that was breathtakingly beautiful. The sun wasn't quite up yet, but the sky was clear, giving her hope that the blizzard was gone for good. Maybe we can build a snowman after breakfast, she suggested with a smile. Okay, Ben agreed eagerly. She took his hand and led him down the path Ian had shoveled to the outhouse. The smell wasn't as bad as she remembered, probably because of the cold and fresh snowfall. She gave Ben the roll of toilet paper, letting him go inside first. When she emerged a few minutes later, taking a minute to use the hand sanitizer from her coat pocket, she couldn't help but smile when she found Ian showing Ben how to pack a snowball. For a moment she savored the image, wishing for something she couldn't have. Ian glanced up and captured her gaze, and for a long second her throat was so tight she couldn't breathe. What was wrong with her? Her emotions were a chaotic mess. One minute she was grateful to Ian for his kind help and support, but then in the next she resented the way he was trying to take over her life. She forced herself to take a deep breath. 
Logically, she knew Ian wasn't really trying to take over anything, but she was afraid to let go of the hard-won control that she'd managed to find after David's arrest. A snowball hit her in the stomach, and her mouth dropped open in surprise when Ben began to giggle. I got you, Mom. I got you. She laughed and brushed off the snow. Yes, you did. Ian scooped up some snow and lobbed it at her, and she let out a yelp as it found its mark. She began to make a snowball of her own, intending to get back at Ian, when Ben beat her to it. I got you too, mister, her son crowed. That's Mr. Ian to you, Ian said as he scooped up more snow. But she was step ahead of him, her snowball hitting him high in his chest. Hey, it's not fair to gang up on me, Ian protested, although the wide grin on his face wasn't the least bit intimidating. The snowballs flew back and forth, missing their intended targets about half the time. Sarah tried to dodge a snowball from Ian, and ended up falling backward into a huge snowdrift. Are you all right? he asked, hurrying over. The concern in his expression made her want to cry. I'm fine, she insisted as he helped her up. Ian's hands were on her shoulders as he searched her expression. His green eyes were intense, sending a fission of sizzling awareness down her spine. For several seconds, it was all she could do not to throw herself into his arms. She couldn't remember the last time she'd had fun with a man. Probably ten years since the summer she'd spent here in Crystal Lake with Ian. Ironic that he'd given that gift back to her today. Another snowball hit Ian in the back. He grinned and glanced over to where Ben was giggling as he scraped together more snow. That's enough Ben, she called out. When another snowball flew by, missing them by a wide berth, Ian shook his head. Uncle. We're crying uncle. Uncle who? Ben asked in confusion. Ian chuckled. That means me and your mom have had enough, he explained. No more snowballs. Ever. Ben asked, a forlorn expression on his face. For now, she clarified, pulling away from Ian's grasp to approach her son. Putting distance between her and Ian didn't help, since she could still feel the warm imprint of his hands through her winter jacket. How about we get some breakfast? Yes? Ben exclaimed. I'm starving. Ian didn't say anything, so she glanced back to find him staring at her intently. You're welcome to join us for oatmeal she offered. A hint of a smile crossed his features. Sounds good. I think I have enough firewood chopped for now anyway. Belatedly she realized there was an entire stack of new wood on the south end of the cabin porch, in addition to the logs he'd already brought inside. And no matter how much she wanted to be independent, she was grateful she hadn't been forced to chop all that wood by herself. Well then breakfast is the least we can do. Inside the cabin she helped Ben take off his winter gear, making sure to put the scarf, hat and mittens near the wood-burning stove to dry. After taking off her own things, she checked the temperature of the water in the tea kettle on the stove. The water wasn't boiling, but she decided steaming hot would have to do. Using the hot water that was in the pan, she quickly washed the dishes they would need for breakfast. Ben came into the kitchen to sit at the table, waiting patiently for her to finish. Ian followed more slowly, as if unsure of his welcome. Almost ready, she promised. I just need to cut up the apples. Okay, Ian said. She filled three bowls with dried oatmeal, and then poured the hot water from the tea kettle over the oats and then stirred them. Then she topped the bowls with green apple slices. Ian surprised her by coming over to help carry them to the table. After taking a seat across from Ian, she glanced over at Ben. We have to pray first, remember? Her son nodded and folded his small hands together. She bowed her head. Dear Lord, thank you for providing this food for us to eat and for the shelter of this cabin. We ask for your strength and guidance as we follow the path you have chosen for us. We ask this in the name of Christ the Lord, Amen. Amen, Ben dutifully echoed. When she lifted her head, she caught Ian's curious gaze, and her heart dropped when she realized he wasn't a believer. Not that Ian's faith or lack thereof was any of her business. Yes, it made her sad that Ian probably didn't pray or attend church, but then again, she didn't know much about Ian's personal life or how much he may have changed. Obviously, 
this was God's way of reminding her that there couldn't be more than friendship between them. No matter how attractive Ian might be. 3. Ian dug into his oatmeal, surprised to learn Sarah was the type of woman who would pray before eating. During their summer together, attending church hadn't been high on their list of things to do. Normally he didn't like looking back at the past, wishing things could be different. Yet there was no denying that he'd always had feelings for Sarah. Ridiculous since they'd been kids back then. Would they still be together if her mother hadn't been diagnosed with cancer shortly after the end of their infamous summer? He had no idea. And there was no reason to think about that now. For the most part, he was proud of the choices he'd made. Fighting crime and standing up for the innocent gave him a sense of purpose. He enjoyed working for the Hope County Sheriff's Department. His record had been spotless until four months ago when his brother Jesse had gone rogue, nearly killing two innocent people, a well-respected ER doctor and a DNR game warden. Not to mention Duke, the game warden's dog. All because his brother had snapped, believing the game warden and the doctor were trying to prevent him from living off the land. After Jesse was hospitalized, Ian had begged the physicians to evaluate his brother's mental health status. One of the female psychologists, Beth Walters, agreed with Ian's concerns and diagnosed Jesse with a severe case of post-traumatic stress disorder from his last tour in Afghanistan. Between the two of them, they convinced the authorities to send Jesse to a psychiatric hospital, rather than to prison. Sheriff Toretti declared Ian to be innocent of any wrongdoing and reinstated him as a deputy. Unfortunately, that wasn't entirely true. He hadn't wanted to believe that the brother he'd idolized from the time they were kids had gone off the deep end. If he'd been smart enough to figure out what Jesse was doing before things had gotten so out of hand, his brother wouldn't be sitting in psych hospital right now, a punishment that Jesse believed was worse than death. Ian tried to remind himself that his brother was getting the help he needed. But was that good enough? Ian wasn't sure. Jesse barely spoke a full sentence during their monthly visits. And Ian figured that his brother blamed him for being locked up again, something Jesse had vowed would never happen. It took him a minute to realize his bowl was empty, and he looked up guiltily, realizing that both Sarah and Ben were staring at him with obvious concern. Sorry, he murmured, pushing his bowl away. I'm used to eating fast between calls. Sarah's smile hit him low in the gut. That's okay, but I guess I needn't have worried you wouldn't like instant oatmeal. He lifted a brow. What's not to like? And the apple slices were a great touch. I'm glad, Sarah said simply. She took another spoonful of oatmeal, as if savoring the taste. It struck him that maybe she'd given him food that she didn't have to spare. Ian gave himself a mental head slap. Of course her funds would be limited, especially if she was on the run from that jerk of an ex-husband. He'd have to make it up to her by bringing more groceries over later. Although first, he'd have to make sure she had the basics, like electricity. He began to make a mental list of things she'd need. The storm had kept him busy for the rest of his shift, so he hadn't taken the time to run a background check on David Franklin. Of course, it would help to have a middle initial or a date of birth to narrow the search. I'm all done, Mom, Ben announced. Okay, carry your dirty dishes over to the counter, Sarah told him. I'll wash them later. Ian took his dishes over as well, doing a quick inventory on the non-perishable food that Sarah had already unpacked from one of the large boxes he'd brought inside. He was glad to see she'd come prepared with canned beef stew, soup, macaroni and cheese, along with the old standby, peanut butter and jelly. It occurred to him that she may have had some time to plan her escape, since it didn't seem that she'd simply emptied out her fridge. Every food item in the box was something that wouldn't spoil yet, appealed to a child. Feeling grim, he decided he absolutely had to follow up on her ex, and soon. He needed to know just what they were up against. Granted, tomorrow was Christmas Eve, but Ian doubted that any man capable of putting fear in a child's eyes would let a holiday prevent him from getting what he wanted. Sarah joined him in the kitchen, giving him a concerned look as she took the bowl from his hands. Ian, you've been up for hours and look dead on your feet. Maybe you should get some rest. 
He was tired since he'd been up for nearly 24 hours straight. After a normal night shift, he would go home and fall asleep almost instantly. But this morning after chopping wood, he'd gotten his second wind. A burst of energy that was fading fast. Soon, he agreed with a crooked smile. But first, I'm going to pick up a generator for you. I don't like the thought of you and Ben being here without power. A frown puckered in her brow. I doubt you'll be able to find one until after the holiday, so don't worry about that now. We're fine. I'd rather you get some sleep. Sarah's concern was touching, he couldn't remember the last time anyone cared whether he was hungry or tired. It was a nice feeling, not that he was looking for a relationship. I happen to have a generator at home, and I don't live that far. I'll be back in less than an hour. Sarah's lips firmed. You can't keep doing this, Ian. I don't want you to feel like you have to take care of us. I appreciate your concern, but trust me when I say that I'd prefer to do this on my own. He tried to suppress a flash of anger. I don't understand what's going through that pretty head of yours, Sarah. Every single thing I've done for you is what I'd do for any other neighbor. This isn't the big city where you don't know the people living next door by name. Here in Crystal Lake, we take care of each other. We're pretty much one big family. Her eyes widened in surprise, and she looked as if she wanted to say something more, but he didn't give her a chance. I have to go. He swept past her and grabbed his coat off the back of the rocking chair. See you later, Ben, he called, before he walked outside and closed the door behind him. He didn't remember Sarah having that stubborn, independent streak ten years ago, but then again, they hadn't had any responsibilities either. Maybe he understood her desire to be independent, but refusing a generator that he wasn't using was downright foolish. Did she have any idea how early darkness fell around here? The sun set by four o'clock in the afternoon, and that was on a sunny day. Refusing light was just ridiculous. He climbed into his car and headed for the highway. Sarah would take his generator whether she liked it or not. And after he'd hooked it up for her, he'd leave her alone if that's what she really wanted. Making sure to ignoring the small part of his heart that longed to spend more time with her and her son. After Ian left, Sarah blew out a heavy sigh and leaned forward, bracing her palms on the kitchen counter. Okay, she'd handled that badly. The good news was that not once had she been afraid. She'd known that Ian was getting angry, but she didn't cower away from him the way she once might have. She'd stood up for herself. So why did she feel so lousy? She gathered the dirty dishes and put them in one of the large pans filled with water. She quickly washed and rinsed them, trying not to think about how much easier it would be to have the generator Ian had spoken about. Being able to use the electric stove would be amazing. Can I go outside to play? Ben asked. Give me a few minutes, she said. I'm almost finished. Why do you have to go with me? Her son's innocent question caught her off guard. Not letting him play outside alone in Chicago was a no-brainer considering the crime rate. But they were safe here in Crystal Lake. Weren't they? Maybe, maybe not. Because it's going to take two of us to build that snowman, she said lightly. There, see. I'm all finished. Her clothes were still damp, but thankfully Ben's hat and mittens were nice and dry. She bundled him up first and then quickly donned her things. Outside the wind was cold, but not unbearably so. First we have to start with the bottom, she said. We have to make a nice big snowball. Okay. Ben was full of enthusiasm as they made a small ball and then rolled it around in the snow, making it bigger and bigger. I think that's good, she said breathlessly, patting the large semi-round base. Now we have to make another, smaller snowball. The sound of a car engine caught her attention, and for a moment she froze in fear, thinking the worst. But then she saw the dark brown sheriff's deputy vehicle rolling down the driveway, and breathed a sigh of relief. David hadn't found them. Hey, you started without me, Ian complained with a smile as he slid out from behind the wheel. Her jeans were soaked from the thigh down, making her shiver with cold. You want to help? Be my guest. He frowned when he saw how wet she was. 
You need a pair of snow pants, he said in a serious tone. Pink snow pants, she corrected. To match my pink jacket. She loved the hot pink color as much as David had once hated it. Come on, the sooner we get this snowman finished, the sooner we can go inside. With Ian's help, it didn't take long to build the rest of the snowman. She sent Ben off to find leaves, sticks and stones to complete the snowman's face and arms. Come on, I need some help, Ian said, gesturing for her to follow him behind the cabin. We need to find a good spot for the generator. Okay, but I hope you know what you're doing, she said, walking along beside him. Because I don't have a clue. We need a dry spot roughly 15 feet from the cabin, he said, looking around the area. Wasn't there a concrete slab back here at one point, she asked, trying to remember. Like over there, near the electrical box. Ian walked over, and used his boot to push the snow out of the way. Good memory. I bet your grandparents had a generator here at one time, which is good news since that will make it easier for me to get this hooked up. Sarah figured Ian was exaggerating, but working together with Ben helping in small ways too, they soon had the generator set up on the concrete slab, with a covered tarp hanging in the trees overhead to protect it from snow. Well let's see if this works, Ian said, rising to his feet. They trooped inside the house, and Sarah held her breath, as Ian flipped on the light switch near the door. The light over the kitchen table came on, and Ben let out a whoop. It works. We did it, her son exclaimed. Yes, we helped Mr. Ian, didn't we? She said, gently correcting Ben. Now it's time to get out of those wet clothes, young man. I'll check to make sure all the lights are working before I head home, Ian said as he shrugged out of his coat. He scrubbed his hands over his face as he walked into the first bedroom. She listened as Ian tested the switches, noting with satisfaction that every light now worked. Ben pulled off his wet clothes and she took her time to spread them around the wood stove to dry. There wasn't a washer and dryer in the cabin, so having electricity didn't help there. Go find some dry clothes to wear, she told Ben when he was down to his skivvies. Her son ran off to the bedroom he deemed as his own, returning a few minutes later, still in his underwear. What's wrong? Couldn't you find your clothes? she asked with a frown. Mr. Ian is sleeping in my bed, Ben said in a loud whisper. Should I try to wake him up? No, let him sleep. Stay here, I'll get your dry clothes. Sarah tiptoed into the bedroom, nearly tripping over the suitcase Ben had left lying in the middle of the room. She quickly gathered Ben's clothes, but her gaze kept straying back to where Ian was sleeping. He looked younger, more like the 18-year-old she remembered from that summer she'd fallen for him. His mink-colored hair was messed up, and the dark shadow of his beard covered his cheeks. He was bigger and broader across the chest than she remembered, and she was surprised by the urge to reach out and touch him. She backed out of the room and closed the door behind her. Enough. She needed to remember that Ian Kramer was off-limits. For one thing, he didn't have faith. But that wasn't the real reason she needed to avoid him. She'd given her heart to a man once before, and David had trampled all over it. She didn't think she'd survive a second broken heart. Ian blinked away the remnants of sleep, disoriented by the darkness. The faint musty odor convinced him he wasn't at home. The ringing of his phone made him realize that's what had pulled him from sleep. Was he late for work? He grabbed the phone from his breast pocket and peered at the screen. Six o'clock in the evening. He wasn't late, but the number was that of his boss, Lieutenant Green. And there were at least a dozen missed calls. This is Kramer, he said, rolling up to a sitting position. Is something wrong? Where are you? Jake Green asked in a clipped voice. Something about his boss's tone put him on edge. Why? What's going on? I went to your place to find you, Jake said, sidestepping his question. Alarm bells went off in the back of his head. For one thing, it wasn't common practice for his boss to seek him out at home. Not to mention the fact that Green kept demanding to know exactly where Ian was, told him something was up. I'm not at home, I'm with a friend, he snapped, getting angry. Come on, lieutenant. Just tell me what happened. There was a long pause, and he imagined Jake Green was carefully choosing his next question. How's Jesse doing? Ian scowled, wondering if this was nothing more than a weird dream. 
He pinched himself just to make sure. He was fine when I saw him two weeks ago at the hospital. Why? Is he sick? Did something happen to him? Where exactly are you right now? Green demanded. Ian knew a direct order when he heard it. As much as it went against the grain to tell anyone about Sarah and Ben, he didn't have much of a choice. I'm at a small cabin in the woods, not far off Highway Double Z. Fire marker number 298, to be exact. The cabin belongs to a Sarah Franklin, named Miller. She's spending the holiday here with her son, Ben. Another long silence, and he suspected his boss hadn't expected that answer. Is Jesse with you? What? Ian lunged to his feet, sweeping his hand over the wall to find the light switch. No, Jess is not with me. I told you I haven't seen him in over two weeks. I only get to visit him on the first Saturday of the month. He drew in a deep breath, trying to remain calm. Tell me what's going on. Where is my brother? That's what we were hoping you'd tell us, Lieutenant Green said in a somber tone. He escaped from the psychiatric hospital sometime early this morning. We've had teams looking for him over the past few hours, but we haven't found him. Ian sank back down on the edge of the bed, his mind reeling. Jesse had escaped? No wonder his boss had been out to his house. Had Jesse been to his place? Had his brother been hiding in the woods, waiting for Ian to leave with the generator? Listen Kramer, we need to know the minute Jesse contacts you. Understand? Ian closed his eyes and shook his head helplessly. I promise I'll call you if I hear from my brother, but I can assure you that Jesse won't try to get in touch with me. Don't you understand? Jesse blames me for putting him in that psych hospital in the first place, even though I thought it would be better than being in prison. He barely spoke to me when I visited. If he's truly escaped, I'm the last person on earth he'd call for help. You better hope that's not true, Green said in a low, intense voice. Because I'm taking you off the schedule until we find him. Off the schedule? Ian knew that Green wasn't thrilled the sheriff had reinstated him, but this was going too far. Ian disconnected from the call and dropped the phone, staring blindly down at his shaky hands. He could barely comprehend that Jesse had escaped the psychiatric hospital. And worse that he'd been taken off the schedule because of it. His career teetered on the brink of disaster. Because Ian knew better than anyone that no one would ever find his brother. Jesse would disappear, never to be heard from again. 4. Sarah was stirring a pot of canned beef stew on the small electric stove when she heard a loud voice coming from Ben's bedroom. Ian must finally be awake. Although from the tone of Ian's voice, she sensed something was wrong. His raised tense baritone seemed to vibrate from the bedroom. She was curious about what was going on, but didn't intend to pry. Ben was content at the kitchen table tying scraps of fabric together to make a chain of garland for their Christmas tree. They picked out a small pine tree outside that would be perfect to decorate. She didn't intend to cut it down, but Sarah felt strongly that she needed to provide some Christmas spirit for Ben's sake. She had a small gift for him too, tucked away in the bottom of her suitcase. Not the holiday she'd envisioned, but being safe was more important. Her son must have heard Ian's conversation as well, as he kept glancing over toward his bedroom. Mom, do you think Mr. Ian is mad at someone? he asked in a loud whisper. I don't know, but I'll go ask since dinner is almost ready. She set the spoon aside and strode over to Ben's bedroom. As she lifted her hand to knock, the door unexpectedly swung open revealing Ian's tall, muscular frame. Hi, she said awkwardly, taking a step back while trying not to notice just how great Ian looked all rumpled from sleep. Her mouth suddenly went dry, as being in close proximity to Ian brought the ten-year-old memory of their last kiss abruptly to the forefront, as if it had happened yesterday. She swallowed hard. Is everything all right? He stared at her for a long moment before he broke the connection and shrugged. Yeah I'm fine. Sorry about falling asleep on you like that. Is everything okay here? Did you see anyone around? No why? She noticed the way Ian was staring out the windows, not that there was much to see in the darkness. There were no street lights nearby, and even the blanket of snow didn't help to provide much illumination. 
Are you expecting someone? He hesitated, then shook his head. No, of course not. Just curious. Sarah wasn't sure why the easy camaraderie they'd had earlier when setting up the generator had vanished, leaving a silted awkwardness behind. She took another step backward, putting even more space between them. I hope you're hungry, because dinner is almost ready. Nothing fancy, just canned beef stew. I am hungry and canned beef stew sounds great, Ian said with a half-hearted smile. She decided that his telephone conversation must not have gone very well. But ah, uh, I just need to take a walk outside for a bit. Can I go with you? Ben asked, abandoning his string of garland to rush over to where Ian stood. Ben, why don't you give Mr. Ian some privacy, she suggested, figuring Ian needed to use the outhouse. You can take a walk tomorrow. Your mom is right, it's pretty dark out so there isn't much to see, Ian said to Ben, real regret shimmering in his gaze. I'll be back soon and then tomorrow we'll take a long walk, see if we can find any wildlife. I guess, Ben mumbled, looking disappointed. Sarah sensed that Ian was determined to go alone, so she walked over to put her hand on Ben's shoulder. If you're tired of making garland, we can play a game of go fish, she suggested. As soon as Mr. Ian returns, we'll have dinner. Ian sent a thankful glance in her direction. I won't be gone long, he said, pulling on his jacket and shoving his feet into his boots. Sarah sensed something was going on with Ian, but was determined not to pry. After all, she had secrets of her own. Granted, Ian knew she was running from David, but she hadn't confided the details of her disastrous marriage. And frankly, she didn't want to. She'd pulled herself together over the two years since her divorce, and as far as she was concerned, she'd put all of the bad memories behind her. She'd come to Crystal Lake to start over in the one place she'd always been happy. Ben would flourish here in a small-town atmosphere, and she wanted to give her son a chance to have a stable upbringing. He'd blossomed during the year David had spent in jail. Okay, Ben agreed, rifling through his backpack to find the pack of Go Fish cards she'd bought at a rummage sale. She turned down the heat beneath the beef stew, then moved the box of fabric off the table to make room for the card game. As they played, Sarah found it difficult to concentrate, especially when she caught a glimpse of Ian through the kitchen window. She frowned, wondering why he was walking through the backyard. Was he checking on the generator? When Ian hadn't returned after the first game of Go Fish, she dealt another hand, her stomach nodding with worry. What was taking Ian so long? Obviously he was doing more than using the outhouse. Did he believe someone was out there? Had he discovered that David was in town? Her blood pressure spiked at the thought. No, David had been scheduled to be released by noon today. He couldn't know where she'd gone. She wanted to believe her ex-husband would follow the court order and not come after her and Ben at all, but she couldn't afford to assume David had truly changed after his stint in jail. If he did try to find her, he'd likely attempt to call her grandparents first, although she'd already warned them not to give away her location. Her grandparents had never liked David much, and while she hadn't confided any details of what she'd been through, the fact that he'd been sent to jail had only convinced them that she'd made the right decision in divorcing him. No, she wasn't worried that her grandparents would give her location away. But she lived in fear that David might remember the brief time early in their relationship when she'd talked about her amazing summer vacation in Crystal Lake. Thankfully, she'd never brought him up here. David had been too busy making her stay home to cater to his every need. But that didn't mean he couldn't find the location of her grandparents' cabin if he really wanted to. I won again, Ben crowed. She smiled wanly and threw her cards down. Yes, you sure did. Sneaking a subtle glance at her watch, she realized Ian had been gone for almost 20 minutes. Should she go outside to look for him? Or stay inside and eat dinner with her son? Eat dinner, she decided firmly. She wasn't interested in living her life around the whim of a man she'd known 10 years ago. Ian could eat cold stew for all she cared. The moment she rose to her feet, she heard the stomping of footsteps on the front porch. Ian came in through the door, his usual smile back on his face. Birds cold out there. An overwhelming wave of relief 
made a mockery of her determination to remain independent and emotionally distant. Is there something wrong with the generator? She asked as he stripped off his coat, hat, and gloves. It's fine, he assured her. And there's no sign of anyone else out there either. For some reason, that statement didn't reassure her the way it should have. Why was he looking around outside in the first place? What had that phone call been about? She wanted to ask, but with Ben sitting there listening to their conversation, she decided to wait until later. Sarah dished up generous portions of beef stew and set them on the table. This time Ben folded his hands, waiting patiently for her to start the evening meal prayer. She took a deep breath, closed her eyes for a moment and cleared her mind. She liked the way even a simple prayer could bring a sense of peace. Dear Lord, we thank you for providing the food we are about to eat and for providing us with shelter from the elements. We ask that you keep us safe in your care. Amen. Amen, Ben echoed. Amen, Ian added. She opened her eyes and glanced up at Ian, surprised to see that he'd folded his hands and responded verbally to her prayer. He hadn't participated in their breakfast prayer, so what had changed his mind? Was it possible that he was open to believing in God, after all? She found herself hoping he was. Since both Ben and Ian seemed to be waiting for her, she smiled and decided to lighten the tone. Dig in, she said. Ben grinned and made a big show of taking a healthy bite of his food. Hot, hot, he exclaimed, dropping the spoon back into his bowl and waving his hand in front of his mouth. Here drink some water, she urged, pushing in his glass closer to him. He gulped the water as Ian chuckled. Ben, I realize you're hungry, but you're supposed to blow on your food to cool it off before you eat it. Like this, he added, demonstrating by gently blowing on his spoonful of stew. Sarah couldn't help compare Ian's good-natured response to the way David would have responded with a sharp, scathing reprimand. And while the last thing she wanted was the complication of another man in her life, she realized that not only was Ian smart, funny, sweet, and sincere, but he was an amazing role model for her son. Everything she'd once dreamed of having in a husband. Ian wasn't sure how he felt about the happiness reflected in Sarah's eyes when he joined her evening prayer. He didn't want to pretend he knew anything about faith or God, but as she'd prayed, he found he agreed wholeheartedly with her words. He was thankful for the food she'd cooked for him, twice now. He was also thankful to be here, spending time with Sarah and her son. And he wanted to believe that God would keep Sarah and Ben safe in his care. After walking the perimeter of the cabin, he was reassured that no one had been out there. At least he hadn't found any human prints other than his own. Plenty of deer tracks and other small game, but nothing to be afraid of. Ian knew that if Jesse had been there, his brother wouldn't have left any tracks behind. The army had taught Jesse well, and Ian knew that in the few hours that he'd been gone, his brother had the ability to cover several miles. His brother was at home in the wilderness, even in winter. Still, Ian planned to head back to his place tonight, just to make sure his brother wasn't there, or that Jesse hadn't left some sort of parting message for him. Not that either scenario would help him hang on to his job. For a moment, a wave of sheer desperation hit hard. What would he do if he lost his position? If he was let go from the sheriff's department, it wasn't likely that he'd find a job elsewhere. He wasn't even sure any hospital would hire him as a security guard, at half his salary. Ian, is something wrong? Sarah's voice interrupted his depressing thoughts. He realized he'd been scowling and cleared his expression, forcing a smile. No, I'm fine. The stew was great. Thanks again for making dinner. You're welcome. It's the least I can do since you've provided the generator for us to use, she said. Do you have to work again tonight? Regret stabbed deep. No, I'm off for the next couple of days. But I have to head home for a while to take care of a few things. All right. Let me know if you need any help, she offered. For a moment Ian was tempted to confide in Sarah, but then realized it wouldn't be fair to make her share his burdens. After all, she had personal problems of her own. One in particular that he needed to dig into for her. He wanted to know more about her ex-husband. I'm all done, Mom, Ben announced, dropping his spoon into the empty bowl with a clatter. 
Carry your dishes to the sink, Sarah reminded him. Why don't you do some more work on the garland? Garland? Ian echoed in surprise. Yes, I found a box of fabric scraps in the main bedroom, left over from my grandmother's quilting days, Sarah explained. We're going to decorate the small pine tree outside for Christmas. Ian was humbled to realize that despite everything that Sarah had gone through, she was determined to celebrate the holiday. He thought back to what he might have at his place. He'd never bothered to decorate much for Christmas, but he was sure he had a box of ornaments tucked away in the basement. I'll wash the dishes before I leave, he said when he'd finished his stew. It's no bother, Sarah said waving away his offer. Now that we have electricity, it doesn't take long for the water to get hot. I insist, he said firmly. He knew he owed her more than cleaning a handful of dishes for letting him sleep half the day away. He was still embarrassed at how he'd conked out on her son's bed. She looked as if she wanted to argue, but must have decided not to waste her breath. Instead, she placed a pot of melted snow on the electric stove and turned on the burner beneath it. When the water was hot, he added dish soap and then quickly washed the dishes. Sarah picked up a towel and dried them, and working alongside her like this made him realize how lonely his life was. Oh, he dated on and off, but nothing serious. Joanna, the woman he'd planned to marry, had decided out of the blue that she couldn't stand living in such a small town as Crystal Lake. She'd gone behind his back to find a new job in the Twin Cities, and, when he'd refused to move, she'd handed back his ring and left the very next day. Truthfully, he could look back at that now and admit that Sarah was right. He was glad he'd discovered the truth before getting married. Thanks for doing the dishes, Sarah said, taking the last pan from his hand and drying it. You cooked, he reminded her. It's only fair that I clean up. She glanced at him from beneath her lashes. So you don't consider cooking and cleaning women's work? She asked. Her tone was light, but the expression in her eyes was intensely serious. Of course not, he said, wondering if that was what her husband had thought. Living alone, I have to do everything myself. Sharing the cooking and cleanup work is a bonus. She smiled and his heart flipped in his chest. As crazy as it might seem, Sarah was more beautiful now than she had been at seventeen. For a long second awareness sizzled between them. He ached to draw her into his arms, the way he had all those years ago. Mom, I have to go to the bathroom. The urgency in Ben's voice shattered the moment, and Sarah instantly turned away to attend to her son. Ian took a deep breath, trying to control the flash of desire. What was he thinking? The last thing Sarah would need is for him to start acting the way he had back when they were teenagers. She was a mother now, and he wasn't in a position to start a relationship. Not when he didn't know if he still had a career. He finished cleaning the kitchen and then pulled on his boots and winter coat. He'd head back home to do a little research on David Franklin to see what Sarah and Ben were up against. And while he believed they were safe for the moment, he didn't like the thought of leaving them here alone all night. He'd camp out on the sofa, especially since having slept all afternoon, he wasn't tired. He walked outside, watching from the porch as Ben came running back from the outhouse. Do you have to go to the outhouse too, he asked. No, I have to head home for a little while, he said with a smile. The kid's enthusiasm was infectious. But I'll be back later tonight, okay? Okay. Ben agreed readily. Ian opened the cabin door for him, watching in amusement as the child stripped off his winter coat, hat and boots and left them in a jumble on the floor. He followed Ben inside, taking a moment to hang the boy's coat on the hook near the door. Take your hat and mittens and put them on the stove to dry out, he instructed. Ben heaved a sigh but did as he was told. Satisfied, Ian headed back outside. He was halfway to his truck when he noticed Sarah striding toward him. You're leaving, she asked. Just for a few hours, he said. I don't want to impose but I'd really like to sleep on your sofa tonight, if that's okay with you. There's no need, we'll be fine, Sarah said, crossing her arms over her chest. I know you and Ben will be fine, but will you please humor me? I won't sleep at all knowing you and Ben are here alone. There was a long pause before she finally nodded. Okay, if you insist. 
But you can't stay with us forever, Ian, she said frankly. At some point, I need to be able to stand on my own two feet. That was the second time she'd alluded to the fact that she wanted to be independent, and he sensed that her need to do so was tied up in the mess her ex-husband had left behind. Sarah, you're doing an amazing job of being on your own, he told her. There's a big difference between being safe and being independent. My priority is keeping you both safe. She stared up at him, and he wished for light so he was able to read her expression more clearly. Thank you, Ian, she finally said in a husky voice. I think that's the nicest thing any man has ever said to me. Her confession rocked him back on his heels. He couldn't bear to imagine what Sarah must have suffered with her ex. Before he could think about the ramifications of his actions, he pulled her close and lowered his mouth to hers in searing kiss. 5. Sarah clung to Ian's broad shoulders, quickly losing herself in the heat of his kiss. Passion sparked between them, almost as if the last time they were together like this was just a few months ago rather than ten full years. He tasted so much better than she remembered, her mouth practically melting beneath his. How was it that she'd forgotten what it was like to be held and kissed by Ian? As much as she longed to stay in the comfort and safety of his arms, she was all too aware of the fact that her son was inside the cabin. The thought that Ben might be watching through the window gave her the strength she needed to break free of Ian's embrace. She stood for a moment, gasping for breath, wishing she didn't feel so lightheaded and shaky. Since when did a simple kiss wreak havoc on her equilibrium? Since Ian. Sarah, he began, but she quickly cut him off. Don't. She didn't want to hear an apology, or worse, some platitude about how this shouldn't have happened at all. Please just don't say anything, Ian. Let's just chalk this up to old times and move on. Besides, I have to go. Ben is waiting for me inside. I'll see you later. Ian stared at her for a minute as if he still wanted to talk about what happened, but she turned and headed back into the cabin, firmly closing the door behind her. When she found Ben curled up in the corner of the sofa, his eyelids at half-mast, she released a pent-up sigh of relief that he hadn't seen them kissing. Sarah leaned back against the door, listening to the rumble of the engine in Ian's SUV as he drove away. Regret was bitter on her tongue. If things were different. But they weren't. She needed to remember what was at stake. In fact, knowing that she was here alone with Ben spurred her into action. She pushed away from the door and turned the deadbolt. After taking off her coat and boots, she crossed over to rouse her son. Why don't you get your pajamas on and brush your teeth? Ben rubbed at his eyes, and then pushed himself up to a sitting position. We're camping, he said peevishly. Don't have to brush my teeth. It was tempting to let it go, but she also knew that if they were going to stay here for the foreseeable future, she needed to set some ground rules. We're not camping, we're living in a rustic cabin. And yes, you absolutely need to brush your teeth. Her son must have been too tired to argue, because he slid off the sofa and padded into the bedroom. He emerged a few minutes later wearing his Spider-Man footy pajamas and carrying his toothbrush and toothpaste. Where should I brush? In the outhouse, he asked. No, of course not. You can brush in the kitchen. She pulled a chair over to the sink so he could reach, and when he finished, she followed him into the bedroom. He crawled into the sleeping bag scooting over so that she could sit on the edge of the bed while he said his prayers. Dear Lord, I'm sorry for the naughty things I did today, Ben said, the way he always did. She often wondered what would happen if she asked him to list the naughty things he'd done, because she was sure he had no clue exactly what they were. Please bless me and my mom and my great-grandpa and great-grandma. Oh, and please bless Mr. Ian too. Amen. Amen, she echoed, surprised that Ian had already been included in her son's prayers. Even though Ben had only met Ian 24 hours ago, she knew he'd made a big impression on her son. She leaned over to give him a hug and a kiss. I love you, Ben, she murmured. I love you, Mommy, he said, kissing her cheek. She hugged him again and then stood up subtly wiping away the tears burning in her eyes. She was thankful that her son was so resilient. So far, the nightmares he'd suffered right after David's arrest hadn't reappeared. 
she hoped and prayed they were gone for good. As she left Ben's bedroom, partially closing the door behind her, she realized she was glad that Ian had insisted on coming back to sleep on the sofa. He was right, there was a big difference between being independent and being safe. And she was willing to do whatever was necessary to protect her son. Ian felt grim as he took his time walking around the perimeter of his property. His instincts were screaming at him, but there was no obvious sign that Jesse had been anywhere near his small house located on the west shoreline of Crystal Lake. Tucked between the trees, his house wasn't easy to spot from either the road or the lake, which was the way he liked it. He scowled, stared blindly into the woods, wishing he had the ability to track people the way his brother did. But he hadn't joined the army the way Jesse had. Besides, tracking his brother wouldn't do any good. He firmly believed Jesse was long gone. Never to return. Ian let out a heavy sigh and trudged back inside. He had no idea how to salvage his career. Unless he could set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Sheriff Luke Toretti. After all, the fact that Jesse escaped from a psychiatric hospital was hardly his fault. He'd been the one to take his brother into custody back in September. Why would he risk his career by helping his brother escape now, three months later? He wouldn't, although he couldn't blame his lieutenant for thinking the worst. Green hadn't been happy to have him back in the first place, and now with Jess's escape, he had a reason to doubt Ian's ability to be impartial. Ian wasn't even sure having at least part of an alibi helped his case. He'd been shoveling a path to the outhouse and then chopping wood when Jesse likely escaped. Sarah couldn't say for sure what time he'd arrived. Besides, gossip flew fast through town, and once his boss learned that he and Sarah had spent the summer together ten years ago, it wouldn't be a stretch for anyone to believe that she'd agreed to cover for him. Sarah believed in God and prayer, and he knew with a deep sense of certainty she wasn't the type of woman who would lie for him. But would anyone believe that? Yeah, probably not. He shook off the depressing thoughts and headed down to the basement. He still had the boxes he'd taken from his mother's house after she'd passed away. As he headed over to the where they were located, he frowned when he saw the large bin containing his hunting and camping gear. Was it possible Jesse had stopped by here, after all? Ian crossed over and lifted the lid. Sure enough, several items were missing, including his boots and his hunting knife. But not his shotgun, which was interesting. Still, he'd have to report this to his boss. Would Lieutenant Green see this as aiding Jess's escape? He thought it was highly likely. Ian replaced the lid with a sigh. He decided to call in the theft directly to the sheriff. The sheriff believed in him once. Ian hoped the sheriff would at least give him the opportunity to explain. He left a message then disconnected from the call and went down to find the box of Christmas ornaments. He brought it upstairs and carried it out to his truck so he wouldn't forget, then decided to clean out his fridge too. No reason to let good food go bad he'd rather take it for Sarah and Ben. After all, she'd fed him twice when she didn't even have extra food to spare. Once he'd filled up a cooler and took that out to his truck, he went back inside and booted up his laptop computer. The generator he'd given her would provide power, but he knew there wasn't any internet service at the cabin, and he wanted to gather some information on David Franklin. He logged into the program that allowed deputies to run background checks, grateful to discover his password still worked. Maybe off the schedule wasn't as bad as being suspended. It took him a while to find the right guy, considering he didn't have a middle initial or date of birth. But then he stumbled upon a David Franklin who'd been arrested a year ago for domestic violence and assault with a deadly weapon. A knife that Franklin had used against Sarah. It was a miracle she hadn't been hurt worse, and yet terrible that her son had been there during the altercation. No wonder the boy had been so afraid of his father. When Ian dug further, he discovered that Franklin had been released on parole earlier that day. His heart raced as he stared at Franklin's mugshot. This had to be the right guy, and explained why Sarah had been driving through the storm. And he didn't blame her. No doubt she'd been desperate to get as far away from this jerk as possible. Sarah's ex-husband didn't look anything like he'd imagined. 
Franklin had dirty blonde hair and a deceptively innocent boyish face. Only his dark, cold eyes gave any hint of his true nature. The fact that Franklin had cut Sarah with a knife made Ian's temper spike. He shut the laptop and rose to his feet. Now that he knew exactly what had happened, and who he needed to protect her from, he was anxious to get back to Sarah and Ben. What if Franklin had already found them? Ian wasn't about to wait a second longer. He tucked the computer under his arm, grabbed his jacket, and headed out to the truck. He made the trip back to Sarah's cabin in record time, thankful that none of the deputies from second shift had caught him pushing the speed limit. Sweeping his gaze over the area surrounding the cabin, he remained alert for anything that seemed out of the ordinary. Franklin didn't look like the type of guy who could blend into the forest the way his brother could, but then again, he wasn't going to underestimate the guy either. Light from a small lamp shone through the living room window, and he found that he liked the idea that Sarah had left it on for him. Especially considering the way she'd abruptly ended their kiss. He still wasn't sure why she hadn't wanted him to say anything. Did she sense he'd been about to apologize? Not so much for the kiss, but for taking advantage of a moment of vulnerability. Maybe. But at the same time, he wasn't willing to simply chalk that kiss up to old times and forget about it, either. In fact, he very much wanted to kiss her again. He gave himself a mental shake, knowing he needed to get his priorities straight. This wasn't about him and his feelings. Yes, he was attracted to Sarah. Yes, he could admit now that he'd never completely forgotten her even after all this time. Yes, he liked the woman and mother she'd become. But as usual, his timing couldn't be worse. She wasn't in a position to be in a relationship, even if she wanted to. And neither was he, considering he had nothing to offer her. No, his top priority needed to be keeping Sarah and Ben safe. The hour wasn't too late, barely nine o'clock at night, but he didn't see any sign of Sarah or Ben moving around inside the cabin. Assuming they were asleep, he unpacked his car, bringing everything up onto the porch before quietly unlocking the door, both the main lock and the deadbolt. He smiled with satisfaction when he realized she'd taken his warning seriously. Moving as silently as possible, he began to unpack the food from his cooler, putting everything into the empty and now working refrigerator. When he finished, he turned around and nearly fell over the cooler in surprise when he saw Sarah standing there watching him. I'm sorry if I woke you, he said, hoping he didn't look as guilty as he felt. I needed to make sure it was you out here, she admitted softly. The image of Franklin's mugshot flashed in his mind and he nodded. I understand. And I hope you're not upset that I kept a key. I'll give it back to you, if you'd rather keep it yourself. No, it's fine. But you didn't have to stock my fridge, she said, a tiny frown puckering her brow. I was going to ask you to take me to the store tomorrow. I'd be happy to take you, he assured her. But there was no sense in letting my food spoil, either. Okay. Well, good night then. Good night, Sarah. She turned and then paused when she noticed his laptop computer sitting on the sofa. When she glanced over her shoulder at him, he could see the unspoken question in her eyes. I found him, he said, cutting straight to the heart of the issue. And I'm not going to let him hurt you or Ben, ever again. She dropped her gaze and bit her lower lip, as if ashamed that he knew the truth. He couldn't stand to see her like that, and he crossed over and tipped her chin up with one finger. Don't Sarah. What he did isn't your fault. He was the one who broke his vows. He was the one who used his anger against you. Don't ever think that there was anything you did that justified the way he lashed out to hurt you. But you don't know everything, she protested weakly. His heart ached for her. I know enough, and I'm glad he went to jail. He broke his vows and the law. I'm only sorry that he was released so soon. Sarah's attempt at a smile was pathetic, and he carefully drew her into his arms, reminding himself that kissing her was off-limits. She didn't need a kiss right now, she needed comfort. To believe in herself. To know that she'd made the right decision in divorcing that jerk. He was surprised when Sarah wrapped her arms around his waist, holding him tightly while resting her cheek against his chest. 
he stroked his hand lightly down her back in a soothing motion. Ian expected her to pull away, but she didn't. And neither did he. He figured he'd stand here, holding Sarah as long as she needed him to. Thank you for being here, she murmured, finally breaking the silence. And you should know that Ben included you in his bedtime prayers. The idea of a five-year-old boy praying for him was humbling. He searched for the proper words to say. I'm honored to be included. I only wish I knew enough about God and faith to do the same for you and Ben. Sarah lifted her head to peer up at him. I'd be happy to teach you about God and the Bible, Ian, she said. And praying is easy. You just speak from your heart and God will listen. She made it sound simple, and yet he knew there was probably much more to faith than that. But maybe as a starting point? Why not? He took Sarah's hands in his and bowed his head. Speaking from the heart wasn't as difficult as he'd anticipated. Dear Lord, please keep us all safe in your care tonight, amen. Amen, Sarah whispered, her eyes suspiciously bright. Her smile was tremulous. See. Easy. Yeah. His throat was thick with emotion, and there were so many other things he wanted to tell her. But he reminded himself this wasn't the time. Thanks, Sarah. I remember going to church as a young boy, but it's been a long time since I thought about God and prayer. The good news is that God is always there waiting for us, she said. To be honest, I don't think I would have made it through these past couple of years without my faith and God's support. I'll miss the people in my church. I'm glad to hear you had some support, Sarah, he said. Although I wish I could have been there for you. She tipped her head to the side. You're here now, Ian. Her words made him smile, and despite his honorable intentions, he wanted nothing more than to kiss her again. He even lowered his head to do just that. But a muffled scream rent the silence. What in the world? He tensed and jerked his head up, searching for the source of the sound. Sarah was already one step ahead of him, racing toward the bedroom where he knew Ben must be sleeping. He quickly caught up to her, hoping and praying that David Franklin hadn't somehow gotten in and grabbed Ben. 6. Sarah's heart twisted in her chest when she realized Ben was thrashing around in his sleeping bag, trapped in the horror of his nightmare. She sat on the edge of his bed and drew his small body into her arms. Shish Ben, wake up, sweetie. You're having a dream, everything's fine. We're safe here. She continued to reassure him until he calmed down and burrowed against her, his hands tightly grasping her sweatshirt. For several long moments he struggled to throw off the dream, his sobs quieting to small, intermittent hiccups. She could feel Ian's gaze on them as he wandered around the room, testing the window to make sure it was secure. Ignoring Ian's presence wasn't easy, but she stayed with Ben long after he'd stopped crying, unwilling to explain the details behind Ben's nightmare to Ian. Lots of kids had nightmares, but Ian was smart enough to do the math, assuming rightfully so, that the young boy who feared his father had been dreaming about him. Ian came to stand beside her, gently resting his hand on her shoulder. Are you all right? he whispered. She nodded. I'm going to stay here for the rest of the night. He surprised her by nodding in agreement. I'll be right outside on the sofa if you need anything. I know but I'm sure we'll be fine. She waited until Ian left the room, closing the door behind him, before easing Ben away from her so she could stretch out beside him. Ben snuggled against her and she kissed the top of his head, her heart aching for him. He was turning six years old in the middle of January, and she hated knowing that he'd already been exposed to fear and violence. She closed her eyes, wishing once again that she'd had the courage to relocate sooner. David had stalked her for almost a year after their divorce before making his move. She clearly remembered the crazy intensity in his eyes when he'd attacked her with a knife, slicing her flank while claiming she belonged to him, ignoring how Ben screamed in terror behind her. She shivered and tucked Ben closer. No, things probably wouldn't have changed much, although there was the possibility that if Ben had been younger, he wouldn't remember that event, to the point his subconscious was haunted by nightmares. Stewing about the past and playing the what-if game wasn't going to change anything, so she returned to her faith, praying that Ben would find peace. Sarah awoke to the dim light of morning with a crick in her neck. 
Ben was still sleeping beside her so she eased upright and slid from the bed, careful not to wake him. Stretching and rubbing the muscles in her neck to help ease the ache, she walked into the living room, surprised to find that Ian was already up and puttering in the kitchen. Good morning, she murmured, trying not to think about how strange it was to share living space with a man. Although this was nothing like her experience with David. Her ex had never once jumped up to help with kitchen duties the way Ian had. And for sure, David had never attempted to cook breakfast. After all, that was her job. And if she didn't cook his eggs the way he demanded, he forced her to start over again. The sick feeling in her stomach forced her to quickly slam the door against those memories. Good morning, Ian greeted her with a smile. I don't know if you like coffee, but I brought my coffee maker from home and brewed a pot. He looked so handsome and at ease wearing well-worn jeans and a cable-knit sweater in a dark blue that matched his eyes. For a minute she couldn't help reliving the heat of their kiss. I'd love some coffee, she confessed, crossing over to the kitchen. I had to settle for tea yesterday. He grimaced comically. Ah. You should have said something. That's like a coffee emergency. I could have rushed to your rescue, bringing my coffee maker over right away. She laughed, enjoying Ian's wry sense of humor. I know. What was I thinking? He poured her a steaming mug, and then pushed the creamer and sugar containers across the counter so they were within reach. Better get started before you go into coffee withdrawal. She added a drop of cream and then took a deep breath, inhaling the aroma before taking a sip. Crisis averted, she murmured with a sigh. This is great thanks. Ian stared at her over the rim of his own coffee for a long moment, making every nerve in her body tingle in awareness. She had the sense that he was remembering their kiss as well. And she was crazy enough to want to kiss him again. She couldn't seem to remember any of the reasons that had seemed so important as a reason to keep Ian at a distance. She'd fallen hard for him that summer they'd spent together, but she liked him even more now. I've never forgotten you, Sarah, he said in a low tone. The summer we were together was the best time of my life. She couldn't find the strength to tear her gaze from his, despite the fact that she knew they were treading on dangerous ground. For me too, she finally acknowledged. But I can't regret all the decisions I made back then, because I wouldn't have been. And my son is everything to me. I understand, and I'm not saying that I want to go back to change things. We were too young to make any sort of commitment. But now that I've found you again, I don't want to lose you. She sucked in a quick breath in response to Ian's blunt admission. And even though she'd promised herself she'd never be dependent on a man again, she knew she didn't want to lose Ian either. I'm not trying to rush you, Ian said, backpedaling to fill the silence. Right now, I'm not sure I'll keep my job. But if by some miracle I am still employed, I'd like to spend time with you and Ben. Wait a minute. What had he said? What do you mean if you're still employed? It was easier for her to focus on the first part of his statement than on the implications of the latter. What happened between the night you found me in the ditch and today? A few months ago I arrested my brother because he went over the deep end, Ian said. He was held captive in Afghanistan, and when he returned home he wasn't the same man. He couldn't bear to be indoors. Then he tried to hurt innocent people. Thankfully we stopped him, and I worked hard to get him the psychiatric help he needed. He's been in a psychiatric hospital, but apparently escaped sometime early yesterday morning. Probably around the time I was outside chopping wood. She couldn't believe what he was saying. Your boss thinks you helped your brother escape? Why would you? And besides, I can vouch for the fact that you were chopping wood for us. Yet you didn't really see me until I brought the wood in, right? She hated the fact that he was right. Still I can vouch for you, she insisted. I'm not asking you to lie for me, and there's more. Jesse took some of my hunting and camping gear, including a knife, which isn't going to look good for me. But I've already left a message with Sheriff Toretti to request a meeting. Until I clear this up, I've been taken off the schedule. Sarah scowled truly upset on Ian's behalf. That's just ridiculous. Maybe I should go with you to meet with the sheriff. 
I'm sure I can set him straight. No, there's no need for you to be involved. I'll be fine, he said firmly. This is my problem, not yours. I was getting ready to make breakfast, he abruptly offered, and she understood that as far as Ian was concerned, the personal conversation was over. Does Ben like French toast? Absolutely, she said, willing to drop the issue of Ian's job for now. Especially since she had more pressing concerns. Like wishing the cabin had indoor plumbing. I'll be back in a few minutes, she said, heading over to pull her jacket off the peg by the door. All right, Ian said, following her outside to stand on the porch. I'll wait here for you. She rolled her eyes and ignored him as she followed the path to the outhouse. There was a tiny part of her brain that chafed at how overprotective Ian was acting. Watching her walk to the bathroom. Really? In the early stages of her marriage to David, she'd thought he cared about her safety and security too. Only to discover that David's true intent had been to control her, isolate her from everyone she knew. And once she was cut off from her friends and family, the verbal abuse started, turning to physical abuse when she'd gotten up enough nerve to file for divorce. And the physical abuse escalated when he'd tried to kill her. Logically, she knew Ian wasn't anything like David. Ian was a cop so of course he had strong protective instincts. She needed to stay focused. But couldn't help wondering if she'd ever be totally free from David's abuse. When Sarah emerged from the outhouse, she saw that Ben was standing beside Ian on the cabin porch, bundled head to toe in his winter gear. They were talking about something intense, and the way her son gazed up at Ian with blatant adoration in his eyes made her heart stumble in her chest. The feeling forced her to realize that while she might be willing to explore a relationship with Ian, there was more than just her own emotions at stake. She was potentially sacrificing Ben's too. Ian enjoyed cooking breakfast for Sarah and Ben, and the child's enthusiasm for Christmas was infectious. When Ben learned that Ian had brought ornaments for the tree, he jumped up and down waving his arms excitedly. Can we decorate the Christmas tree now? Can we? Please? Ben begged. We have to do the dishes first, Sarah said with a smile. Remember the rules? Mr. Ian cooked so we have to clean up. It's okay, Ian said, but she sent him a stern look. No, it's not. We have all day to decorate the tree. We need to do the dishes first, she insisted. Oh, Mom, Ben whined. Ian recognized the stubborn glint in Sarah's eyes and knew better than to interfere with her parenting style, so he nodded and backed off. That's fine, I need to make a few calls anyway, he said. He took his phone off the charger and moved into the living room, leaving Sarah and Ben to their cleanup duties. He called the Hope County dispatcher first, hoping to catch Sheriff Toretti before the holiday, but of course he wasn't there. Ian asked to be transferred to the sheriff's voicemail so he could leave another message. He stared at his phone for a minute and then called the dispatcher back. Hey Kristen, I need you to put an alert out on a guy by the name of David Franklin, he said. I'll send you the link to his mugshot so you can put the deputies on notice. His ex-wife and son are here in Crystal Lake, and he might be planning to violate the restraining order she has against him. Do you have a reason to believe he's in the area? Kristen asked. Has he called or threatened her? Did his gut instincts count? No, nothing that concrete, but it doesn't hurt to put his picture out there just in case. I guess not, Kristen reluctantly agreed. Okay, shoot the mugshot over and I'll put all the deputies on alert. Thanks. He disconnected from the call and then sent the picture through his phone. Fifteen minutes later, Ben came rushing over. We're done with the dishes, he announced. Can we decorate the tree now? Ian glanced up and caught Sarah's wry gaze over Ben's head. I don't know, he said to Ben. Maybe you need to ask your mom. Ben spun in a circle so fast he nearly toppled over. Can we mom? Please? Yes Ben, we can go outside to decorate the tree. Ian opened the box of ornaments and showed them to Ben. Some were fancy and others were homemade by both him and Jesse. They had put a clear plastic coating over their school pictures one year, and he was surprised his mother had kept them. Some of these are fragile, so we have to be careful, okay? Ben's eyes were wide with awe. 
Okay. Ian carried the ornaments outside to the porch, while Sarah helped Ben with his coat and boots. She brought out their handmade garland too, and then walked over to the small pine tree not far off the porch. I thought this one would be the perfect size to decorate, she said. I'd rather not cut it down so we can decorate it next year too. All right, Ian said, secretly thrilled to hear that Sarah was planning to stay in Crystal Lake. He only hoped that he could hang on to his job, since he wanted nothing more than to celebrate more holidays with her. Although Ian knew that even if he was able to stay on with the sheriff's department, he'd have to take things slow. Sarah had every reason to be gun-shy when it came to entering into a relationship. She knew him well enough to feel safe with him. To know that he'd never hurt her or Ben. But that wasn't the real issue holding her back. Sarah claimed she needed to be able to stand on her own two feet, but she'd already proven that by filing for divorce and surviving David's vicious attack. Ian sensed that the real problem was that Sarah wasn't sure how to care about someone else without losing herself in the relationship. People who cared about each other, supported and encouraged each other to do better. But she hadn't experienced that phenomenon with her ex. He hoped he could show her what a true relationship was all about. Obviously the main reason he hadn't found someone else was because he'd subconsciously compared other women to Sarah only to find them lacking. He smiled to himself as he helped put smaller Christmas ornaments on the top of the small pine tree, leaving Ben and Sarah to decorate the lower branches. He was already envisioning a quiet Christmas Eve in front of the fire. He didn't have gifts to give Sarah and Ben, but somehow he knew Sarah wouldn't mind. Oh no, the box is empty, Ben complained. Don't forget the garland we made, Sarah said and we have time to make more too, if needed. Ben's grimace made Ian smile. When his phone rang, he pulled it out, his pulse quickening when he recognized the number of Sheriff Toretti on the screen. He connected with the call, moving up toward the cabin porch for some privacy. This is Deputy Kramer, Ian said, adopting a formal tone. Thanks for returning my call. You left three messages, Ian, the sheriff said dryly. I figured there had to be some sort of emergency, so I decided to give you a call before leaving for the afternoon. My kids are in the church Christmas pageant. Ian cleared his throat, a little taken aback by the knowledge that Sheriff Toretti attended church on a regular basis. Thank you sir, I appreciate the call. However, I was hoping to discuss my status with you in person. I could be there in 15 minutes if that works for you. What about your status? Sheriff Toretti asked. Ian was surprised at the question. Lieutenant Green took me off the schedule after my brother Jesse escaped from the psychiatric hospital yesterday morning. There was a long moment of silence, and Ian really wished he was there to see Sheriff Toretti's face. Was it possible he hadn't known about Green's action? Could it be that his lieutenant hadn't sent the paperwork through yet? Did you have anything to do with your brother's escape? Sheriff Toretti finally asked. No sir, but there's more. I believe my brother got into my house and took some of my hunting gear. And I don't have the best alibi either. I was here chopping wood at Sarah Franklin's cabin, but she didn't see me until roughly 0800 hours. Ian glanced over to where he'd left Sarah and Ben decorating the tree, frowning when he didn't see them. Does Lieutenant Green know about your alibi? The sheriff asked. But Ian wasn't listening. Still holding the phone near his ear, he jumped off the porch, looking all around the clearing for any sign of Sarah or Ben. He even ran down the path to the outhouse, only to find the building empty. Kramer, the sheriff said sharply. Are you there? Fear gripped him around the throat, making it difficult to breathe. Listen. I need you to send two deputies here right away," Ian said urgently. I also want an APB put out for David Franklin. I believe he's kidnapped his ex-wife and his son. To his credit, his boss didn't hesitate. Done. Don't do anything stupid, Kramer. Your backup will be there soon. Thank you, Ian choked out before disconnecting from the call. He slid the phone into his pocket and returned to the area where Sarah and Ben had been winding their homemade garland around the tree. There behind the tree, 
closest to the dense woods, he saw extra footprints in the snow. Two sets of footprints heading into the woods. No way was he waiting for backup. Ian ran inside the house, grabbed his service weapon, and then bolted back outside. He couldn't bear the thought of losing Sarah or Ben. 7. Sarah wanted to claw the smirk off David's face as he held a knife against her son's temple. But she didn't dare let her hatred show on her face, keeping her expression as neutral as humanly possible. Please Lord please keep Ben safe in your care. David had emerged from nowhere, grabbing Ben before she knew what was happening. From their position behind the Christmas tree, she could barely see where Ian had been standing and talking on the phone, immersed in his conversation with the sheriff, much less take the risk of calling out to him. Not when her ex-husband had figured out the best way to get her cooperation was to manipulate her weak spot. Threatening to kill Ben was enough to make her bite her tongue and to follow along with his plan. Shut up, David said harshly when Ben whimpered in fear. You're scaring him, she pointed out rationally. Too bad. Move it, Sarah. Now. She did as he asked, following David who was carrying Ben. Her ex-husband wasn't an outdoorsy kind of guy, but David wove a path through the trees, seeming to know exactly where he was going. As she followed David deeper and deeper into the woods, her mind raced as she tried to think of a way to get Ben away from him. Because deep down she knew David didn't want their son. He wanted her. But even worse, he wanted to make her suffer the way she'd made him suffer by sending him to jail. Her greatest fear was that David would torture Ben as a way to wound her. She curled her fingers into fists, determined to do whatever it took to divert David's anger to her, drawing it away from Ben. But how? Hurry up, he said in a low tone when she lagged behind. The road isn't far. The road? Was that his escape plan? Did he have his car there? She wished she knew how David had managed to find her location so quickly. Obviously he'd remembered that innocent comment she'd made about vacationing in Crystal Lake. He must have done some research to pinpoint the location of her grandparents' cabin. It was too late to worry about that now. She risked a quick glance over her shoulder, her heart sinking to the pit of her stomach when she didn't see Ian anywhere behind them. She'd thought for sure he'd notice they were missing by now. David was moving at a swift pace, which convinced her he had a plan. And she was very much afraid they'd reach David's car before Ian even knew they were gone. She stifled a scream when her ex-husband tripped badly, letting go of Ben to brace his fall. Her son fell first, partially beneath David. Fearing the worst she rushed forward and tripped too, landing close to her son. She crawled over the snow to reach her son, pulling him away from David, the sounds of Ben's tortured sobs tearing at her heart. Gathering Ben close she surged to her feet, preparing to run. But Ian abruptly emerged from the woods, jumping on top of her ex to prevent him from getting up. Watch out. He has a knife, she shouted. Ian dug his knee into David's back, pressing on the back of his head so he couldn't move. David Franklin, you're under arrest for violating your restraining order, Ian said in a harsh tone. He grabbed David's wrists and snapped on a pair of silver handcuffs. He came. Mr. Ian came, Ben whispered. Yes he did. Sarah's eyes filled with tears of happiness. And love. She loved Ian. How that was possible in such a short time frame, she had no idea, but she loved him more than she'd thought possible. She'd been infatuated with the 18-year-old he'd been 10 years ago. And she loved the man he was today. But Sarah knew that things wouldn't be easy. Especially with his brother's escape hanging over him. But she didn't care. She'd do whatever possible to help him restore his career. So they could have a future together. Ian tightened his grip on Franklin, determined to prevent him from getting away. And he silently thanked God for protecting Sarah and Ben. I'll get you for this, David said, squirming frantically. Was that a threat? Ian asked, hauling David up to his feet. I'll be glad to add that to the list of pending charges. You're not going to get out of jail for a long time. Didn't you know that kidnapping is a federal offense? David acted as if he wasn't listening. His gaze seemed to be glued to Sarah. 
You're nothing but a whore, he said in disgust. Then he spit at her. Ian yanked him backward, but David's heels became caught on something. Ian scowled and glanced down at the ground. What in the world? Then he saw it, a nearly invisible string of what looked like fishing wire stretched between two large trees. A trip wire. Where had it come from? Who'd set a trip wire? Jesse. Ian gave himself a mental shake, unwilling to believe it. Surely his brother was long gone. Wasn't he? Of course he was. Why would Jesse stick around? And even if he had, what would have alerted his brother to the danger surrounding Sarah's ex-husband? Still the tripwire nagged at him. The sound of someone calling his name made him glance over his shoulder to find two deputies, Devin Armbrister and Jason Thomas, walking toward him. Is everything under control? Dev asked. Yeah. I have it under control. Ian stepped on the tripwire so that he could pull Franklin along. I've read him his rights, but you might want to do it again so that there's a witness. He didn't add that, technically, he wasn't actually on the schedule, which was a legal loophole they didn't need. Violating his restraining order, huh? Dev asked. Along with kidnapping under the force of a deadly weapon, Ian confirmed. He had a knife but must have dropped it. We'll find it. Dev read Franklin his rights and then searched along the trampled snow for the knife. When Dev found it, he used a plastic bag to pick it up before turning to grin at Ian. Got it. I think he has a vehicle parked on a road too, Sarah said. At least that's where he seemed to be taking us. I'll check it out, Jason volunteered. Ian let the other deputy go, turning towards Sarah and Ben. His gut clenched when he saw a scratch along Ben's cheek. Are you sure you're both all right? Thank you for saving us again, Sarah murmured, her eyes suspiciously bright. I never should have turned my back, Ian said harshly. It's my fault he was able to get close enough to grab you. Stop it, Sarah said, putting her hand on his arm. We can't beat ourselves up about this. It's not your fault any more than it's mine. David did this. He's the one at fault. Logically, Ian knew she was right, but it wasn't easy to set aside his guilt. If he hadn't been so focused on his career, she and Ben wouldn't have been in danger. Mr. Ian. Ben's voice was thick with tears. Will my daddy go back to jail now? His heart ached for the child who had seen too much violence in his young life. Yes, he'll go to jail, Ben. For a long, long time. Ben reached out his arms silently asking for a hug, and Ian immediately stepped closer and pulled the child against his chest, holding him close. Sarah's smile made him realize that this was all that mattered. Not his career, not even the fate of his brother. But the three of them. The woman he'd never forgotten, and her son. A child he'd willingly raise as his own if given the chance. Kramer? Armbrister? The sharp command had him glancing up in surprise. Sheriff Toretti himself was striding toward them, the deep scowl etched in his face. Ian handed Ben back to Sarah and straightened to face his boss directly. Yes sir. I see you have the suspect in custody, Sheriff Toretti said. Is anyone hurt? Franklin's son Ben has a cut on his cheek from the suspect's knife, Ian said. We'll be fine thanks to Deputy Kramer, Sarah interjected in a loud voice. She stepped toward Sheriff Toretti and shifted Ben in her arms so she could extend her hand. Bemused, Toretti took it in his. It's nice to meet you. My name is Sarah Franklin and my ex-husband David Franklin grabbed my son and held him at knife point, forcing us to go with him. And I will absolutely press charges to the fullest extent of the law. Ian choked back a laugh, as Sheriff Toretti took a surprised step back at the vehemence of her tone. I'm glad to hear you weren't hurt and that you intend to press charges. And that Deputy Kramer saved us, Sarah added pointedly. That too, Toretti agreed. Hey, I found his escape car, Jason said as he jogged back through the woods toward them. Ian, did you find it first? He frowned. No. Why? Jason shrugged. I found the hood unlatched and the distributor cap was missing. Figured maybe you found and disabled the vehicle first, before coming after them. Another chill snaked down his spine, 
and Ian knew that the tripwire and the distributor cap must have been the work of his brother, Jesse. Nothing else made sense. It wasn't me, he said sharply. I followed Sarah's and David's tracks through the woods, making a wide circle so I could come at them from the side. That's true, because I was surprised to see Ian coming at us from the west rather than from the south, Sarah agreed. Sheriff Toretti lifted a brow. Then who pulled off the distributor cap? Ian shook his head. I don't know sir, but I found a tripwire which is what stopped Franklin from getting away. When he realized he was still covering for his brother, he forced himself to voice his suspicions. We need to consider the possibility that Jesse might have done this. The minute the words left his mouth, he wished he could take them back. Up until now, he'd looked like a hero. Now he could tell his boss and his colleagues were looking at him as if he were guilty by association. Did you see your brother? Sheriff Toretti asked, breaking the strained silence. No, sir. I didn't see anyone either, Sarah said. And trust me, I was looking for help the entire time David was holding a knife on my son. Ian wished Sarah wouldn't keep jumping in to help support him. Dev and Jason had already exchanged a knowing glance, obviously wondering about their relationship. He hated the thought of her good name being dragged down by his. But since he'd gone this far, he figured he may as well tell them everything. Sir, remember I mentioned that some of my hunting things were missing? It's possible that I had fishing line in there. The same type used as the tripwire. Jesse easily could have followed me here to Sarah's. Maybe he stumbled across David and watched him grab Sarah and Ben. In fact he might still be nearby. There was a long pause as Sheriff Toretti pondered their next move. Okay fine. I'll call for reinforcements to help search the woods. Kramer, get the woman and her son back to the cabin. We'll take their formal statements later. Armbrister, you and Thomas take the perp into custody. Yes sir. Armbrister and Thomas gladly hauled David Franklin away. Ian took Sarah's arm, thinking it was odd that Sheriff Toretti didn't order them to begin searching the woods immediately, although it was also important to get Franklin safely secured in jail too. Still, didn't he realize that even a slight delay would help Jesse escape? I want to walk, Ben said, squirming in Sarah's arms. Will you let me carry you? Ian asked. We'll get back to the cabin sooner that way. Okay. Ben's eagerness brought a wry smile to Sarah's lips. You'll always be his mother, Ian said in a low voice. I know. He was surprised when she tucked her hand beneath his elbow, as they covered the distance back to Sarah's grandparents' cabin. When they reached the clearing he stopped and stared at the Christmas tree. There weren't lights, but seeing his mother's ornaments amidst Sarah's homemade garland made him catch his breath in awe. Beautiful, isn't it? Sarah whispered. I'm glad we didn't cut it down. Me too. Especially since we can see it from the living room window. He walked closer, and then stared when he saw Jess's homemade ornament, the one sporting his photograph, sitting prominently at the top of the tree when Ian had originally placed it somewhere in the middle. Jesse had been there. What did the placement of the ornament mean? That Jesse had forgiven him. Had Jesse saved Sarah and Ben, as a way of telling Ian that he was doing better mentally? No, it wasn't possible. No one could get over PTSD that quickly. But maybe just maybe, Jesse had learned how to control the flashbacks. At least enough not to be a danger to anyone else. Ian? Is something wrong? Sarah asked. He tore his gaze from the Christmas tree and shook his head. Nothing is wrong. I just realized how lucky I am to have found you again, Sarah. The entire time that jerk had you were the longest moments of my life. I was so worried that I wouldn't get to you in time. I knew you'd come after us, she said with confidence. Come inside. We'll drink some hot cider and read the story of Christmas from the Bible. That's an offer I'd never refuse, he said, carrying Ben up to the cabin porch. But even as he set Ben on his feet, he swept his gaze over the clearing in front of the cabin one more time. But there was no sign of Jesse. And Ian found himself praying that his brother would be safe so that one day he could have what Ian had found with Sarah and Ben. 
peace, love, family. Sarah sat in the rocking chair as she read the story of Christmas while Ben snuggled next to Ian on the sofa. When she finished, she pulled the gift she'd gotten for Ben out from the hiding spot behind the pile of wood. Merry Christmas, Ben. A present. Ben's eyes widened with excitement, and he jumped off the sofa to cross over to her. For me. Yes? He quickly tore off the wrapping paper, letting out a squeal of glee. A remote control truck, he crowed. Can I play with it, Mom? Please? Sure, she said, glad she'd purchased a pack of batteries too. She sipped her cider while Ian helped Ben get the truck out of the package so he could insert the batteries. Here you go, Ian said, handing Ben the remote. Be careful that you don't break anything. I won't, Ben promised, moving the lever to make the truck race across the room. He followed, making the truck spin in circles and then sending it tearing off into the bedroom. Why don't you sit over here? Ian suggested, patting the sofa. She set her cider aside and went over to sit beside him. When he wrapped his arm around her shoulders, she leaned against him. This is the best Christmas ever, she murmured. Really? Even though David found you? Ian asked. Yes. We're finally safe now that he's back in jail. She inhaled Ian's musky scent. And I'm thrilled to be here with you. I didn't get you a gift, Ian said. She tipped her face up to his. Spending time together is the only gift I need. Sarah, he murmured before lowering his mouth to hers in a soft kiss. She reached up to pull him closer, trying to show him how much she cared. She was lost in his kiss for a long moment before Ian lifted his head. Sarah, I love you so much. Ian said, tucking a strand of her hair behind her ear. I know it's probably too soon for you, after everything you've been through with David, but I need you to know how I feel. Her heart swelled with joy. I'm glad Ian, because I love you too. More than words can say. Ian's smile slowly faded. That makes me happy, Sarah, but I can't ask for anything from you until I know what my future holds. Don't be ridiculous. I don't care about your job. Besides, if that sheriff of yours has a brain, he won't let you go. You were honest and upfront with him about your brother. And you did your job, even while you were suspended. Ian shook his head. There's that stubborn streak again. Funny, I don't remember that from ten years ago. She wrinkled her nose at him. I've always been stubborn, you were just too nice, so there was nothing to argue about. Ian chuckled and then shifted in his seat to cup her face in his hands. I love you, Sarah Miller. And I hope that one day you'll do me the honor of becoming Sarah Kramer. Tears pricked at her eyes. That depends. Me and Ben are a package deal. I'm counting on it, Ian said, leaning forward once again to seal his promise with a kiss. Epilogue Eight weeks later Ian held one of Ben's hands with Sarah holding the other, as Ben skipped between them. They'd just come from church, and were stopping by the post office to pick up his mail before heading home. Sarah had become his wife ten days ago, on Valentine's Day, and they were now living in Ian's cabin. They were having one of the worst winters on record, but even that hadn't put a damper on his spirits. Ian knew he was the luckiest man alive. Sheriff Toretti had taken his suspension off his record, and had given him his former shift back, so he wasn't working graveyard anymore. Sarah was working as a nursing assistant at the hospital, and Ben was flourishing in his new school. And he'd started the process of formally adopting Ben as his son. The only shadow hanging over him was that there had been no sign of Jesse since the incident with the Christmas tree ornament. Can we get ice cream? Ben asked. Ben, it's only 10 degrees out here, Sarah protested. How about hot chocolate instead? How about a hot fudge sundae? Ben countered. Ian bit his lip to keep from laughing. He knew that kids needed structure and discipline. He tried hard not to interfere with the way Sarah raised her son. But the way Ben tried to use logic to get his way always cracked him up. No ice cream, Sarah said firmly. They walked into the post office, stomping their feet to get the snow off. Ian took off his gloves to get the key to his post office box, 
and then went over to get his mail. When he opened the box, he found the usual bills and junk mail, along with a postcard. He frowned and turned the postcard over, but the side where messages were normally written was blank. Only his name and address were neatly printed on that side. Along with a postmark out of Alberta, Canada. What in the world? He flipped the card back over to peer again at the glossy photo. There was a lake surrounded by forest and the words Lake Louise, Canada. Jesse. This was his brother's way of letting him know he was still alive and had made it to Canada. Was he trying to get to Alaska the way he'd wanted to? Maybe. Or maybe he'd stay in Canada. Ian couldn't help feeling relieved as he tucked the postcard into his coat pocket. At least he knew that Jesse was safe. And maybe being free to live off the land would heal him better than being in jail or in a psych hospital ever could. He walked over to join Sarah and Ben. Ask your father, Sarah said with a sigh. Dad, can we please have ice cream? Ben begged. Mom says it's too cold. Ian knew he'd never get tired of hearing Ben call him dad. He glanced at Sarah who shrugged as if to say it was his call. It is too cold. No ice cream, but we'll stop at Rose's Cafe for hot chocolate, okay? Ben groaned but didn't complain as they made their way back outside. Sarah surprised him by pulling him down for a quick kiss. Thank you, she murmured. For what? Thinking was impossible when she kissed him like that. For being the best husband and father. Always, he promised before he kissed her again. Yeah, he was the luckiest guy in the world. And he vowed to never take his family for granted. I hope you enjoyed Sarah and Ian's story. Are you ready to read Janelle and Devon's story in Second Chance? Click here.